I have a question about um, that the church often quotes Galatians 3, where Paul says that the promises made to Abraham were made to his seed. And because of the Zara seed is singular there, the church interprets this as a referring to Jesus. How logical is this conclusion? And can you tell more about this concept? When I read Galatians 3 for the first time in my life, I probably was 17. Yeah. When I tripped over Galatians 3, Galatians 1 and 2, Paul's trying to explain how fantastic he is and how his revelation is superior to everyone else. When I came to Galatians 3, which is the centerpiece of the entire book, of all six chapters, three is the point. My heart broke. My heart broke for the nations of the world that they read this drivel and their minds were filled with such lies. When Christians hear this, what I'm about to share with you, they're really in shock. These are not mistakes that Paul made. Paul deliberately mischaracterized the Jewish scriptures in a way that destroyed the soul of billions of people worldwide. In the Hebrew language, the word zera, as you see it in the Torah, biblical Hebrew, there is no plural. Paul is trying to make a point in Galatians 3, verse 16. The promises that were spoken to Abraham and his seed. The scripture doesn't say unto his seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person. And who do you think that one person is, Paul insists, Paul argues, that's got to be Christ. Believe me, I'm not making this up. For Jews who are listening to this for the first time, probably shocked. If you go back to the passages that we're speaking about, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, I beg people to look, at, to look this up for themselves. Take a look at Genesis 15, Genesis 17. God says these words, I will make your offspring, your seed, zaracha, your seed, like the dust of the earth, like the stars of the sky that they cannot be measured. How could Paul play with the Word of God? In the English language, there's a word sheep. Sheep can mean one sheep or many sheep. <laughs> Don't say sheeps. Imagine if I would engage in this kind of criminal activity and say, you see, it says sheep and not sheeps. must be Christ. You would send me to a psychiatrist, or you would know that I'm a that I'm playing games. And that's what Paul is doing here. Galatians 3 begins by Paul castigating, excoriating Galatians. Who are they? These are non-Jews who lived in what is present-day Asia Minor or present-day Turkey. Asia Minor. Churches that he had set up and then moved on in his travels. These non-Jews from present-day Turkey encounter Christians who tell them that they have to keep the Torah in order to be saved. Paul hates the Torah, hates the observance of the Torah. He condemns it repeatedly throughout his letters. He excoriates the Galatians. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Paul then sets up a a conflict between two covenants. This should be mind-boggling to any, per, any sober mind. That covenant that God made with Abraham was based on faith, where the Torah says, your seed will not be able to be counted. Just please look it up for yourself. Does that mean one seed? Or does that mean so many that you can't even count? You may be wondering, what do you mean you can't count? You can count everything. We can pretty much estimate how many, how many grains of sand there, there are on the beaches of the world. We really can. Can't be counted. What can't be counted? The only thing that can't be counted 
are things that are supernatural. Everything in nature can be counted. We can count the planets and we can count the stars. They can be counted. We can count the cups of water in the seas. We can count them. We can even count the number of molecules in a glass of water. And that's more than there are cups of water in all the seas. What does it mean that can't be counted? It means Lamaila the nation of Israel, is supernatural. If it wasn't for God's plan and providence according to his wisdom, the nation of Israel would have disappeared. Every other nation disappeared, but the children of Israel are here and the Bnei Ishmael, the children of Ishmael, they have a covenant as well. That's it. The rest are gone. You want to know about Canaanites? Go to a library, blow off the dust of the books. And you can read history about them. They're gone. They held the torch high for a time. But they've disappeared now. But the Jew has seen them all and beat them all. And we're here, not because we're great, because the God of Israel keeps his promise. So God makes a promise to Abraham because Abraham trusted in God. Abraham will continue to display that trust. God will tell him a little later in 10 chapters that the covenant was formed with you because you kept my laws and my decrees and my statutes. In Christian theology, that's impossible. So that's what's the meaning of faith is. But then with tension, Paul seeks to set against that the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, the Torah at Mount Sinai. And he says, if you have two agreements, which agreement takes precedent? Which agreement is the greater one? It's the earlier one, of course. This should be mind-blowing, as though there's tension. But he sets up that tension. This is what Paul's doing. And he got away with it. Why? Who were his audiences? His audiences were non-Jews who, didn't, who couldn't tell the difference between chaff and wheat, between genuine biblical hermeneutics and the mischief and the criminal behavior that Paul routinely engaged in. When Paul says the words that Scripture doesn't say seeds, but says seed, he's lying to you. He's lying to his audience, and he got away with it. He got away with it because his audiences were Gentiles, and his Gentiles couldn't read the text, couldn't read Hebrew, none of them could. Only the Jews could. And this explains what happened. This is why, for the most part, in all of Paul's letters dated to the letters that are indisputed are dated to the 50s, it's largely Gentiles who are becoming Christians, not Jews. It's, there are exceptions, but it's... Why? Because the Jews are looking at this and they're running for their lives. They're saying, get me out of here. But the Gentiles, unfortunately, didn't know any better. They fell for this drivel, for this screed. If you would try to pull a stunt like this in a courtroom, a lawyer who would do this would lose his license to practice law in most countries because this is fraudulent. And that's what Paul is engaging in here. Paul is saying that, that the seed that God made the promise to is Christ because it doesn't say seeds when there is no such word as seeds in biblical Hebrew. This could break the heart. And Paul ultimately wants to, the point he wants to get to is that the covenant has been undone with the Jews. And there is a covenant, but it's only in the body of Christ that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, man or woman, all one in the body of Christ, Galatians 3.28. This is a tragedy. And the goal is to expose this, to shed light in this dark place so that people will come home to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why it's so important to have this uh, uh, rectified, because it's not a mistake. It's deliberately uh, used by Paul. So. It's very true. And, you know, in the Christian universities, you, you know, the academic world in the West, they're, they're not that religious. They're not. Generally, they're not. The people who teach New Testament at in Holland's greatest universities generally are not fundamentalist Christians. Almost none of them are. But they they still go, well, you know, Paul is a hermeneutic. They they can't get it out of their mouth until they talk to me. <laughs> 
sometimes I sit down with, you know, I talk to New Testament scholars. I'm, I'm friendly with many of them. And they have this attitude. So on one hand, most of them recognize this. Why they're, unless they're in a fundamentalist Christian university, most of them are not. They're very liberal Christians, if they're Christians at all. But they try to find some way, because they can't get it out of their mouth, that you're reading lies. This is a lie. This is not a mistake. This is not like someone misunderstood it or, you know, no, this is not like someone thought that they had a vision and, and made a mistake. I'm sure some of the ladies who say they have pancakes with the Virgin Mary every morning for breakfast in the Philippines, I'm sure some of them, whatever, some people are just not well, you know, so, you know this is not that. This is not people who are meditating and seeing, seeing Buddha or whatever. This is a deliberate falsification. This is the protocols of the elders of Zion. This is a fabrication and it needs to be exposed so that the nations will turn to the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm.